pleasure to have Dave here today. It is certainly not his first visit, and uh, he is uh, someone who has quite a career behind him and ahead of him yet. Dave uh, got his uh, engineering degree, electrical engineering, from the University of Colorado, and then an MS and PhD from Michigan, University of Michigan. He spent time as um, in Bell Labs as a research uh, scientist, and then came to UC Berkeley and has been on the EECS faculty at UC Berkeley until he retired in 2005. And Dave was a colleague of my husband in that department, so I've gotten to know him for many years. Dave has a long interest in SETI. He actually helped us, I hope you remember, back when we were developing the MCSA and had some problems. You were one of a, a Tiger team that we pulled in to help Ivan Linscott debug that system. Um, his research involves uh, advancing digital transmission systems. And in fact, he is, I think, the digital signal processing communications engineer's engineer. Right? Dave is incredibly talented in this field. He's the author of five textbooks that are used in, in teaching communication theory. And he uh, actually in 1999 was recognized by the IEEE with the Alexander Graham Bell Medal for his work in advancing digital telephony. Um, he is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and he is also an entrepreneur. Dave was telling me just a couple of moments ago that what he has done with the software business community is equivalent to what we're trying to do with the SETI Quest community, is trying to find a place where people who are interested in developing these new techniques, methodologies, can come together and, and share best practices and, and learn in an open environment, an open community, the word that we're getting to, uh, to be so much more familiar with around here. And he's done this in conjunction with folks at the um, University, Helsinki University of Technology. Now for the past um, several years, Dave has been working with Jerry Harp and with me in supervising Samantha Blair, who was a postdoc here until she left to go become the friend of the telescope at the Allen Telescope Array. And the question was, um, if we should, in fact, now that we have computing capability, consider looking for broadband signals as opposed to the narrowband artifacts that have been what we have been searching for for decades. And if we were to do that, what would the transmission medium between the extraterrestrial transmitter and us, that is the ionized interstellar medium, what would that tell us about what kinds of broadband signals would be the best to use? So might, in fact, the nature of the medium tell us something about how to go searching for an ET signal? And Dave, thank you for coming to talk to us. Can you hear me? Okay, good. I don't have to talk too loudly. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about end-to-end -end communication system design for communicating with other stars. That's the basic topic. Uh, now the, the motivation here and goal is that exchanging information with other solar systems would be an exciting voyage if we were able to accomplish this. Um, however, the capabilities and limitations of the universe to support such exchanges is a little understood uh, topic. It's really never been investigated. Uh, so this work really is uh, a baby step in the direction of that understanding. Now some of the deep challenges that we have in uh, communicating with other uh, solar systems, aside from not knowing which solar systems harbor intelligent life uh, and which may be interested in communicating, which is a huge challenge, but also there's no possibility from a communication system design perspective, there's no chance of doing experimentation up until at least the first such real exchange. There are, however, a lot of relevant astronomical observations that we are going to have to rely upon. 
Uh, secondly, there is no possibility of coordination with the people we're exchanging information with. Now, normally when we design a communication system here on Earth, uh, we have a standards committee and we go and negotiate and we come up with a common agreement on how to do this. As far as we know, there are no standards committee uh, for communication in the, in the interstellar internet. Um, so we have to rely on what I call implicit coordination, which is a design guidance provided by a number of considerations. Now this applies whether we're in the business of transmitting a signal, hoping it'll be received by someone, and, and here we're talking about information bearing signals, not just signals that attract attention. Uh, but also, uh, if we're designing receiver, looking for such signals. In other words, the SETI uh, activity. Both of those require this sense of end-to-end -end communication system design, not just designing a transmitter or not just designing a receiver, but end-to-end, -end, and require some s implicit forms of coordination to deal with the complexities of the problem. Now, here are some things that we can use for implicit coordination. This is kind of a list that I keep in mind when I'm doing this work. Um, keep it simple. Uh, if we get anything approaching the complexity of communication systems we use here on Earth, I think it would be hopeless to do that without the, the intervention of a standards committee. So it has to be extremely, extremely simple. Uh, we rely a lot on fundamental limits and the resulting optimization, because the good news is if uh, we ask the same questions as ET and we both do optimization with respect to that question, I'm talking now about mathematical observation, uh, optimization, and fortunately communications is full of, optim of optimality uh, proofs, then we'll come to the same conclusions. We have to. So that's really helpful. Uh, we also have a lot of physical impairments such as the ionized interstellar medium that affect communication, and that, those are actually helpful. You'd say, well, darn, I wish we didn't have that. We could really uh, push the information out, but actually those impairments are very helpful in narrowing down possibilities um, because we really have an, a needle in the haystack uh, issue otherwise. Well, even with that, we have a needle in the haystack issue, but it would be much worse. We have to make assumptions about capabilities and resources of both transmitter and receiver, and we have to be aware of possible motivation or incentives in the process. Uh, and we have to be aware, willing to search over a lot of possibilities in all of these dimensions. Now, uh, two distinctions I'd like to uh, put in your mind. One is the idea of a tractor beacon, which is the kind of thing we've been searching for so far in SETI versus an information-bearing signal. Here I'm going to talk about information-bearing signals. Uh, secondly, discovery, which is the, process, uh, the initial discovery of such a signal, as opposed to ongoing communication once we've discovered the signal. Now, ongoing communication is a lot easier problem because we've already narrowed down a lot of the search parameters and also because we have an opportunity to estimate a lot of things about the propagation and so forth by uh, doing time averaging. We have a lot of opportunity to estimate things that we d have no clue about uh, in the discovery process. So I'm gonna deal with the discovery here, which is the immediate issue and is also the harder problem. Uh, so I'm gonna talk, in this, in this talk, I'm going to talk about the radio frequency communication. Of course, there's other possibilities such as light I'm going to talk about information bearing signals and I'm going to uh, kind of focus in on re receiver design for discovery of the signal, but also the question of what the signal, what signals we should look for, which is really a transmitter design issue because it's the transmitter who, does, who chooses the signal that's transmitted. Um, the impairments I'm going to narrow down because we only have an hour or so here today. I'm going to talk about white noise, which is uh, something that's thermal noise introduced, uh, if, no, if nowhere else is introduced in the receiver. Uh, radio frequency interference that's always present in the vicinity of the receiver. Um, and I think that's actually an important impairment because we're, our own experience here on Earth has been that the interference is growing and growing. And uh, the people who are transmitting 
are probably a more advanced civilization than us and they're further down that path and so they probably have experienced much worse interference than we have. And so hopefully they're quite uh, sympathetic of our problem of detecting their signal in the presence of interference. If so, as I'll point out later, that's very, very helpful in narrowing down the kind of signals that we should be looking for. And thirdly, I'm going to talk about one of several impairments that are experienced in the radio propagation through the interstellar medium, namely dispersion that's caused by the uh, clouds of ionized uh, hydrogen gas. Um, now, uh, the first issue in designing communication system at radio frequencies is that we're going to have a signal uh, which is at passband, and I'm going to assume notationally that the carrier frequency is FC and that the bandwidth of the signal is W. And both the choice of both parameters, FC and W, are extremely important uh, to both transmitter and receiver. Now the first thing we're going to do on a receiver is demodulate down to baseband, which means shifts the whole spectrum by FC, the carrier frequency. Uh, so there's a double frequency term over the left here, which I haven't shown, which is easy to eliminate with low-pass filtering. And so we're left with a baseband signal between 0 and W hertz. That baseband signal is complex valued. And um, that's always the case uh, corresponding to the in phase and quadrature carriers. So all the signals I'm going to be dealing with are complex valued, and this is the reason, because we're looking at a baseband equivalent of a passband signal. Um, so we're going to focus on the complex baseband signal in the talk, keep everything at baseband. And uh, we have to ask, first of all, how are we going to communicate information? Well, the simplest possible technique would be, and actually we're, uh, it's in interesting that the, uh, on the right-hand side, this, the uh, title of the slide is missing. So if you uh, want to see the title of the slide, look on the left-hand, or on your right, my left. Okay, so we're going to assume digital modulation. Now, digital, all, virtually all new communication systems on Earth are, are digital. And it's very compelling, and I think there's very strong reason to believe that interstellar communication, that our friends who are transmitting in our direction would choose digital also. Um, so the way digital works is we have a set of data symbols, BK, which are chosen from a finite alphabet, and our, our job at the receiver is to figure out which of, of, the sig of these data symbols was transmitted. So it's a detection problem. Um, and there's two basic styles of modulation that are used in terrestrial systems. Uh, one is amplitude modulation where we basically take a pulse waveform, H of T, and multiply the amplitude, and by amplitude in the complex domain I mean both amplitude and phase. Uh, we adjust the amplitude and phase according to the uh, data symbol. And we, re we repeat that over and over again, so we get a whole train of pulses that are amplitude modulated. Another alternative that's used here on Earth is uh, we have a set of waveforms. Instead of just one waveform, H of T, we have a whole set of waveforms, and we index which waveform we transmit in accordance with the data symbol. An example of that would be orthogonal um, modulation and, sig and signaling. So at their uh, fundamental level, uh, virtually all uh, terrestrial communication systems use techniques from one of these two classes. Now, if we're, if we're talking about discovery of such a signal at the receiver, we have two alternatives. One is to look over multiple symbols, that is multiple of these pulses, and the other is to look on a symbol by symbol basis, that is try to discover individual waveforms, individual symbols. Um, <coughs> here we're going, in this talk, we're going to talk about the symbol by symbol op option. The advantage of the symbol by symbol option is that we are insensitive to the modulation scheme. We don't care whether it's phase modulation, amplitude modulation, orthogonal modulation. Uh, if we're just looking for a waveform that's somehow adjusted in terms of its phase and amplitude, then we don't have to make any assumptions about uh, the modulation scheme. Um, 
if we want to do a multiple symbol, then we have to start making assumptions about what kind of modulation scheme the transmitter is using. Um, but of course, we're paying a price by looking at an individual symbol because we're potentially foregoing energy, which is present in many symbols. Uh, but if we're going to detect an individual symbol um, in the ongoing communication phase, we have to have a certain signal and noise ratio, a certain received signal energy. And that same signal energy, by definition, also allows us to discover the signal. Um, so, you know, it works. Now, um, the question is, what should the waveform H of T be? That's really a key question. Both if we were to transmit, what would we use? And if we were going to receive, what would we use? So H of T, remember, is just a single pulse that's going to be amplitude modulated or uh, one of a set of orthogonal pulses that's going to be transmitted. So the first thing we assume is that uh, it's time limited and bandwidth limited. And I would suggest that both uh, are reasonable assumptions because of just basic physical constraints. Um, so capital T in this talk is going to be the time limitation on the pulse and W, it, capital W is going to be the bandwidth accordance with the earlier diagram of the demodulation. So if we were going to be a transmitter, we would have to ask, you know, what should W and T be? Uh, now T is something that is related to the data rate, the rate at which we're communicating information. So uh, one of the considerations in choosing capital T would be how fast do we want to communicate? Bits per second or megabits per second at what, what rate? Um, bandwidth is, a, is a basically an independent parameter that we can choose independent of the uh, data rate, somewhat independent. We'll talk about that later. What other properties should H of T have? That's a transmitter question. Receiver question is, how advantageous is it to know about H of T or can we get along with making very few assumptions about what H of T is? And the answer is, depends on how sensitive we want to be in our detection. If we want to operate at relatively low signal energies, we're, it's helpful to know more about H of T. That's a fundamental property of our universe, of nature, that the more we know about the signal we're looking for, the more sensitive our detection of that signal can be. And that will come out at several points in the subsequent uh, development. And how does the receiver infer the knowledge about what H of T is, what H of T to look for? So right now then, temporarily, I'm going to consider only two impairments, noise and interference. And I'm going to show you how optimization allows us, to, based on those two impairments alone, to infer very specific and credible properties for what W of T and H of T should be. Uh, now that's a very fortunate circumstance because it says uh, if ET, who's going to transmit a signal in our direction, is asking these same questions, then they're going to, because this is a mathematical optimization, they're going to come to the same conclusion. Okay, so the first, the first point is that um, we'd like to turn this problem into a finite dimensional problem, the design of this waveform. And we can do that because it's time limited and bandwidth limited. So it turns out that it's finite dimensional, equivalent to uh, complex Euclidean space. The choice of H of T is equivalent to the cho choice of a vector in Euclidean space, where the dimensionality of that Euclidean space is the time bandwidth product, the product of W and T. Now we can get at that by, for example, if the signal was time limited, we can do a Fourier series analysis, get a series of harmonics, and uh, the, the largest harmonic is determined by the bandwidth of the signal. So the total number of harmonics we have to choose is the product of bandwidth times time duration. Another alternative is if the signal is, is strictly band limited, we can use the sampling theorem, which says the signal can be represented as a superposition of pulses, which are like interpolation functions between samples. And uh, if it's time limited, then we only need a finite number of those pulses. So again, we, we conclude that the number of pulses we need 
is the product of W times T, the time bandwidth product. Now, there, you could imagine other bases that uh, us or an ET might use, but I think it's, in my own judgment, it's unlikely. Uh, you know, the concept of frequency, concept of time are so fundamental uh, to both our physics and our engineering culture uh, that it seems unlikely that there would be another choice. But uh, we do have to use whatever basis the transmitter is using. That is, we have to be coordinated in that, in that sense. So uh, there's some basic facts that I'll just share with you uh, based on this finite dimensional representation of the pulse H of T. One is that in the finite dimensional space, the results from analyzing uh, the reception in the presence of white Gaussian noise, then the, we, we have a noise vector corrupting the signal, which is uh, k dimensional, if k is the product of W and T. And so uh, that's a complex valued noise vector. So that corresponds to a real valued vector with 2k components. And that noise vector is completely random. What do I mean by completely random? It has several strong properties. It's Gaussian. All those noise elements are jointly Gaussian. Uh, they are statistically independent. They are zero mean, and they all have the same variance. So that's what I mean by completely random. And that, um, you can't get any more random than that, it turns out. It, you know, you have to define what you mean by random, but uh, with reasonable definitions of randomness, you can't get any more random than that for a finite dimensional uh, vector, random vector. It has another property which is isotropic. I'm going to delay talking about isotropism. Um, choice of basis. As I said earlier, the transmitter and receiver must assume the same basis. So what I'm going to do is choose the Fourier series, but it, obviously we need to, uh, at minimum, repeat what I'm going to go through assuming a sampling theorem basis because you know, our friends across the galaxy may reasonably use the sampling theorem rather than Fourier series. Or there may be other possibilities and we shouldn't rule that out. Uh, but we do have to assume the same basis to proceed. Uh, and the dimensionality of this basis I mentioned before is the time bandwidth product, and I'm going to use the notation capital K for time bandwidth product. Um, now, the d I use the term a lot, degrees of freedom, because the dimensionality of this basis is actually the number of degrees of freedom in the design and signal. It's the number of independent complex numbers that I have to choose in order to fully specify the signal. Now, isotrop isotropic noise. In this finite dimensional space, after I've done the analysis, for analysis of the reception or of the waveform H of T in the presence of noise, um, the signal is actually one dimensional. The signal is just a vector in that k dimensional space. So the signal is one dimensional, it's pointing in a particular direction. But there's noise in every dimension. And one of the properties of, um, in every degree of freedom, I should say, one of the properties of uh, the completely random noise is that it has this spherical symmetry, meaning it's isotropic. That means that no matter what direction we look, we see the same statistics. Look any direction, okay? isotropic noise. Um, so that's really the nicest and most fundamental property of completely random noise that we're dealing with in this circumstance. Now the noise has a total energy equal to, it's proportional to K, the, dimension, the number of degrees of freedom. And so there's a certain um, variance in the noise in any direction, which we call sigma squared, and the total variance over the whole vector, over the whole degrees of freedom, is K times sigma squared. So, but the component of noise in the direction of the signal is much smaller. The component of noise in the direction of the signal is just sigma squared. So there's k times as much total noise as there is in the direction of the signal. So an obvious strategy for the receiver is to look in the direction of the signal, assuming the receiver knows what the signal is, the direct, 
knows the signal vector, the uh, receiver should look in the direction of the signal and ignore everything else. In the process, the receiver is eliminating most of the noise. That is k minus 1 divided by k of the noise energy is being eliminated in that process. So that's what a match filter does, and that is, by various, any cr reasonable criterion, the optimum thing to do in this circumstance. Um, so look in the signal direction. The sensitivity then turns out to depend on the length of the signal vector, which is, uh, this notation here is the signal energy, which is the square of the length of the signal vector. And it also depends on sigma squared, the noise, ener noise energy per component, per degree of freedom. Okay. The uh, sensitivity of detection does not depend on anything else. Does not depend on anything else. In particular, it does not depend on what W is. It doesn't matter what T is. It doesn't matter what K is. It doesn't matter the shape of H of T, the particular waveform. So detection in noise really says very little about what signal we should transmit and what signal we should receive. Okay, nature is being kind of unkind to us. Um, it's not telling us anything about time duration, bandwidth, shape, anything else. And again, that's because in the process of looking in the direction of signal, we're eliminating most of the noise. And the total amount of noise does depend upon the number of degrees of freedom but the noise in the direction of signal does not. So now let's turn to interference. The fortunate thing, nature turns out to be very kind to us here in the case of interference because interference tells us very specific properties that the waveform H of T should have. <coughs> uh, and again, it's a process of optimization. Okay, so now let's develop some intuition about interference by looking at a couple of special cases, and then we'll talk about the general conclusion. In the case of a narrowband interferer, which is in this WT uh, plot, is an interferer which is con typically continuing over a long period of time. It's just, you know, it's some kind of other data signal or uh, communication signal that's interfering with our reception. And we're assuming that it's narrow band, so that it's, it has a, rare, a narrow bandwidth relative to W, the bandwidth that we're going to choose for our signal. Then uh, we can immediately draw some conclusions about uh, how we can reduce the effect of this interference on our signal. Those are shown here. First of all, we want the signal energy to be uniformly distributed over the bandwidth 0 to W. We don't want our signal energy to be concentrated at some frequencies. We want to be uniformly spread. Why? Because uh, that way, it doesn't matter what the frequency of the interference is, it'll have essentially the same effect. Okay, but if we concentrate the en our energy at certain frequencies, then interference at those frequencies will be more deleterious than interference at other frequencies. Secondly, we want W large. Why do we want W large? Because the larger the bandwidth W of the signal, the less of the signal overlaps the interference. And therefore, in the process of detecting the signal, the less influence the interference will have on, on that detection. We also want T to be small because the total interference energy that comes in and interferes with us is the interference power times the length of time, T. And the, the bigger T is, the more energy we're going to admit into our detection process, the more interference energy we're going to admit into our detection process. Okay, if everybody is cool with that notion, let's switch forces and say, well, what happens if the interferer is actually broadband but has a narrow bandwidth? So like, you know, the, the narrow band interference would be like your microwave oven and the broadband interferer would be like the pulses coming out of your vacuum cleaner, switching noise, you know, short pulses. So let's assume that we have an interferer which has a very broad bandwidth, but is very tightly limited in time. In this case, the conclusions are similar, but reversed. We want the signal to be energy to be uniformly distributed over zero to capital T seconds, 
because that means less of the signal is overlapping the interference. So the interference has less impact on our detection. In this case, we want T to be large and W small. We want T to be large so that as we make T larger and larger, then less and less of the signal is overlapping the interference. And assuming that it's uniformly distributed energy. And W small says we're picking up less and less of the total interference energy into our detection process. Okay, so the more general conclusion, those are two special cases. The more general conclusion uh, flows out of the mathematics, and I'm gonna give you the, the uh, intuition rather than the mathematics. Um, the, what we want is the signal to be isotropic. That is, we want the signal energy to be spread over the entire bandwidth and over the entire time uh, sort of uniformly. That's consistent with the two special cases. So that, what we say, you know, the, the mathematical term for that is isotropic. Now, then you can prove with a very, very simple proof, you know, about three equations and a quarter of a page. Uh, and if I can go through this proof, uh, ET across the galaxy can do the same proof fairly easily. You come to the conclusion is that if you were to choose a, a signal randomly, now remember noise does not provide us any guidance as to what the signal waveform should look like. So if, if, if uh, you know, noise gives us no guidance, then we can do anything we want. So let's choose the signal randomly and ask what distribution would we choose, would we apply to choose the signal? And the answer is we would want a, a distribution that was completely random, the same distribution as the noise. So statistically, our signal looks the same as the noise. Now you say, well, that makes it hard to detect. No, it doesn't because we're at the receiver looking for a very specific signal. It's a one-dimensional vector. It's just that we chose it uh, from a, a completely random distribution. So that's one way to get at a signal which has uniformly spread energy over time and over frequency. And this, by the way, is a more general conclusion than all of communications theory. When you design communication systems and you do it well, you pretty much always come to the same conclusion. The signal should look like noise if it's well designed, statistically. So this is just a particular example of that more general conclusion. Um, the other important thing is if we choose the signal randomly, now of course that has some practical difficulties that how does the receiver know what the signal is if it was just chosen randomly by the transmitter. We'll address that issue in just a moment, so hold on. But if we choose the, the signal randomly and it's chosen from completely random distribution, then it's isotropic. That means that any direction we look, the signal energy is the same, statistically. That's a statistical statement, okay? Uh, obviously, the signal itself is a vector in the space, the one we've chosen, but statistically, we say if we look over all possible choices of random signal, uh, it's isotropic. That means that only a fraction one over K, where K is the number of degrees of freedom, is lined up with the interference, whatever the interference is. And importantly, it doesn't matter what the interference is. Conclusion is the same. So the performance of the receiver in a statistical sense is independent of what the interference is. And that is the optimization that we're doing here. We would like the performance of the detection of the receiver to be independent of the interference. It doesn't matter what the interference is. So we get that property if the signal is isotropic because the fraction of the signal energy that's lined up with the interference is one over K times the total signal energy. So there is a reduction in interference by a factor of K going through the detection of the signal. Okay, so that says that we wanna choose WT very large, K, the number of degrees of freedom, equal to WT to be very large. And we have a name for that is called spread spectrum, okay? So spread spectrum simply means the bandwidth of the signal is much greater than necessary to support the data rates that we're communicating. 
And spread spectrum is a pretty standard technique for radio communications here terrestrially. Most modern radio communication systems use spread spectrum. And this is one of the reasons. On Earth, there are other motivations, but uh, in this particular application, this is the only motivation, that is rejection of interference. The other important point is that if ET was transmitting a signal like this and it was impinging on the Earth, uh, the searches that we're doing do so far would miss it. So it would be spread over very wide bandwidth, right? And we're looking at very narrow frequency slices. So the fact that we have not detected a signal like this is not surprising because the detectors we've been applying would not be capable of detecting a signal like this. Um, now, let's get to the issue of, well, obviously the receiver in order, this argument depends on the receiver knowing what the signal is, and the sig receiver can't know what the signal is if it's chosen randomly from a completely random distribution. Well, that's where pseudo-random sequence generation comes in to play, and this is what we do in earthbound communication systems as well. We choose not from a totally random ensemble, but we actually choose an algorithm that generates a signal that looks random. It looks random in the sense that if we applied any statistical test to that signal, we could not distinguish it from truly random signal. So that's what we mean by pseudo-random. Uh, so I've generated a signal here, the real and imaginary parts. This is lo very low degrees of freedom. This is only 100 degrees of freedom. Uh, in practical case on the interstellar, we might be interested in 1,000, a million, a billion degrees of freedom. Okay, much, much larger than this. But this is 100 degrees of freedom. This is a signal that's generated using a binary expansion of pi. I make a statement here, and I'm not completely uh, sure I can back up this statement, uh, that pi is history's most studied pseudorandom generator. Uh, it certainly is an extensively studied number, going back to the ancient Greeks. And in particular, one of the properties that's been extensively studied is uh, its quality as a random number generator, and it turns out to be essentially perfect, okay, from, from any perspective. In fact, uh, if you take the larger class of irrational numbers and choose one at random, then with probability one, it's basically a perfect random number generator, something called normal number. Um, it's not known where, whether pi is a normal number or not. Seems like an easy issue, but no, no mathematicians ever cracked it. Um, but uh, it certainly has been studied in terms of applying very statistical tests, and it turns out to be essentially a perfect random number generator. Okay, so, but backing off a bit in terms of the idea that we want a signal which is uh, spread uniformly in time and also spread uniformly in frequency, uh, you know, waveforms like a sinusoid or a pulse, don't, a simple smooth pulse, don't have those properties. Signals that have both of those properties simultaneously <coughs> are signals like this that look like noise, that have a noise-like character. And so the idea that the signal meets a statistical test for being completely random is basically a mathematical statement of the more intuitive concept that the signal should look like noise. It should have lots and lots of squiggles in order to be good in the presence of interference. <coughs> now, there's a big monkey wrench. Uh, we're, we're advocating that from the point of view of interference, we would like to have uh, signal waveforms that were very wide bandwidth. Um, the time, T, is more constrained because there are time-bearing effects on the ICM like Doppler and uh, scattering and scintillation and so forth that we have to worry about which I've listed here, turbulence in the interstellar media and so on. These limit the, the capital T that we can use. Uh, and that's fortunate that they do because it narrows down the possibilities considerably. Um, but in terms of time invariant kinds of effects going through the interstellar medium, 
The one I'm going to focus on today is plasma dispersion, but there's another one, uh, scattering, uh, which is simply an inhomogeneous inhome version of the, of the plasma dispersion. And uh, we're currently studying scattering. Uh, we have a postdoc uh, that Jill mentioned who's studying scattering, and we're trying to understand its effects. So today I'm going to deal with the plasma dispersion. The issue here is that if we're going to transmit a very wide bandwidth through the ISM, then we have to deal with the dispersion that, that's introduced by these propagation effects through the ISM. So the question is, what is the effect? Okay, so we're going to do a stress test. You know, like the, the uh, Federal Reserve does a stress test of banks. We're going to do a stress test on the ISM. And in particular, a stress test of the ability of the ISM to support very large bandwidth signals. Now, there are two reasons why the bandwidth of the signal might be large. One is because it's spread spectrum, as we've been talking. The WT is large. And one of the ways we make WT large, partic particularly since T is constrained, it relates to the data rate and it relates to time varying effects, so it's more constrained. One of the ways we make the bandwidth large is choose W very large. And that will be very helpful with respect to interference and will not harm our ability to detect the signal in noise. Okay. The other reason W might be large is because WT is on the order of unity, uh, which is the, the smallest W we can get away with to support a data signal of pulses that are transmitted at rate capital T. Uh, the smallest W is when WT is on the order of unity, but in fact, 1 over T might be large because we're trying to support a very large data rate through the ISM. And in that case, W will be large. 1 over T is the rate at which we're transmitting pulses, and therefore it's the rate at which we're communicating data symbols. <coughs> so in this talk, we're going to choose spread spectrum for several reasons. Uh, one is it suppresses interference. Another is that it's usually less affected by multipath. At least it has a general reputation that it's less affected by multipath. And in the ISM, we have multipath, which we're not talking about today, due to these scattering effects, you know, refractive and diffractive effects in the inhomogeneous uh, uh, clouds of, of ionized uh, gas in the interstellar medium results in multiple paths from transmitter to receiver. So we're not talking about that today, but we expect that this spread spectrum will be pretty insensitive to that, relatively speaking, because that's our experience on Earth. Discovery is actually easier in the spread spectrum case for reasons having to do with inter symbol interference. The interference, the dispersion causes uh, interference among these symbols that are transmitted in time. When we start making 1 over t large, that inter symbol interference starts to hurt us, and that makes the discovery much harder. And another reason that ISM bandwidth is free, so why not use it? Now, why is it free? Well, um, we're it w in order to communicate effectively between two solar systems, we're going to have to use very highly directive antennas. So there might be a lot of other communications going on between other pairs of solar systems out there. We hope so, actually. It makes SETI you know, more successful much sooner. Uh, but if so, we're not going to interfere with those by using a large bandwidth because we're transmitting a highly directed beam at a particular solar system. So our main defense against interfering with other communications in the interstellar internet is the highly directed nature of our energy that we're transmitting and receiving. So and a particular bandwidth doesn't harm us in any way other than potentially the amount of computational uh, resources that we have to apply and issues like that. Okay, so, um, so all those say spread spectrum is an interesting possibility if, if, if the ISM can support these wide bandwidth signals. And so that's the stress test that we're now performing. How do, well does the ISM support uh, that kind of communication? Well, the ISM is a conductive medium due to ionization in stellar glass clouds, and as a result, it has a frequency-dependent or wavelength-dependent refractive index, meaning that uh, the energy is slowed down as it passes through the ISM, and some arrives uh, 
some frequencies, the energy arrives sooner than at other frequencies. So that's what we mean by this plasma dispersion. Uh, the um, pulsar astronomers have studied this extensively because it affects their observations. Uh, and the kind of the standard formula that they use flowing from this refractive index is given here, that there's a group delay dependent upon frequency, the inverse square of the frequency. And in this group delay, um, this is group delay over and above the speed of light delay. So this does not include speed of light, just the excess delay due to the presence of, the, of these uh, uh, ionized gases. There's a, con there's a physical constant D, uh, we don't have to worry about it except for its value. There's a, there's a, a parameter called DM or dispersion measure. A d dispersion measure is kind of a weather report for the ISM. It's a measure of the current density of free electrons in the line of sight between us and wherever we're communicating. So, you know, when I get up in the morning, I check the temperature, what it's going to be today. When a pulsar astronomer gets up, I suppose they go and check on the dispersion measure. So it's the ISM weather report. Uh, it has a physical interpretation of a column density. Uh, and the important thing is it ranges between a, a f values between about a 1 and a 1,000. So there's about a 1,000 a to 1 range uh, depending upon line of sight. If we look toward the center of the galaxy, we'll get a much larger dispersion measure than if we look away from the center of the galaxy. Um, so from a communication point of view, what we're interested in is something called delay spread, which is the range of group delays across our bandwidth from the carrier frequency to the carrier frequency plus W. And that's equal to the group delay at the lowest frequency because the group delay actually decreases with frequency uh, minus the group delay at the highest frequency. Here's a plot of the uh, delay spread versus the, uh, on the vertical axis in a log-log plot. And on the horizontal axis is the frequency between uh, half of a gigahertz and 10 gigahertz. And this is for uh, W equal to one megahertz. The bandwidth is one megahertz. And we plot four values of dispersion measure, you know, four weather conditions in the ISM. Uh, one, 10, 100, and 1,000. The delay spread is larger when the dis dispersion measure gets larger. <coughs> The important point here, the, though, is that dispersion favors large frequency, high frequencies. Um, the reason being that the uh, delay spread decreases as the cube of the carrier frequency. And so uh, we get over this range about three orders of magnitude reduction in the, in the uh, delay spread over this frequency range. The delay spread for this particular set of parameters, and this is the parameters I'm going to use in my subsequent uh, numerical examples, uh, goes from about at low carrier frequency in the range of one millisecond to one second, at higher carrier frequency in the range from uh, one microsecond to one millisecond. Okay, so. Now, as communication people, we like to think in terms of frequency response. You know, everything has a frequency response if it's a linear time invariant uh, system, as this plasma dispersion is if we look over fairly short time scales. So we have a frequency response or transfer function, which is, has a magnitude and a phase. And the relationship between group delay and phase is that the group delay is the negative of the slope of the phase. So uh, here's a plot of the actual group delay versus frequency over one megahertz bandwidth. And it's approximately linear. You know, over la larger range of frequencies, it's quadratic or inverse quadratic. But over a relatively short, small range of frequencies, it's approximately linear. So we have a large group delay at the low end of the band and a low group delay at the high end. And we've normalized the group delay at the high end of the band to be zero because we don't care about flat delays in the uh, transmission. The resulting phase has this is quadratic, as shown here. However, this is 
this is obtained by solving that little differential equation, integrating that little differential equation. It actually is many cycles of 2 pi that we're showing here. This is the unwrapped phase, or what a pulsar astronomer, I think, would call unfolded phase. If we fold the phase, by, uh, which is what we actually observe, by looking at a modulo 2 pi, in that previous example, we get this. Now, to me, this looks like a fountain outside, you know, where water's flowing over and you've got these little waves of water flowing down. But you look at that and you say, oh my God, we've got to deal with this? <laughs> this looks impossible, right? It looks very complicated. And furthermore, the details of this structure will be very much strongly dependent upon the uh, DM, the dispersion measure. So that doesn't, uh, you know, that looks a little scary. Um, however, it turns out that that's only because we're looking at it in, in the wrong terms. Uh, if we look at the impulse response of the channel, the impulse response is the inverse Fourier transform of that frequency response. And in this case, I've used the DFT, so I've taken the inverse discrete Fourier transform of E to the I times the phase. The, this is what the impulse response looks like. Now, again, the impulse response is complex value, so it has a magnitude and it has a phase. But the impulse response is a whole lot easier to interpret intuitively because it says that the energy or the magnitude, and by the way, for those of you who are maybe not familiar with the terminology, impulse response simply means if we were to transmit a very narrow, high energy pulse, then the ISM would ring over time like a bell because some of the energy is arriving with different delays, and that's the impulse response. And what's get, what we're seeing is that the energy in the impulse response is about uniformly distributed up to the maximum group velocity. So uh, this is simply the fact that the group, group delay is linear means that the energy is spread over time in approximately uniform fashion. Now the phase uh, is a jumbled mess, looks quite random. But the magnitude is very nice and it's very intuitive. So we're simply seeing everything that's transmitted being received in little, in little uh, pit, you know, fractional pieces that are kind of uniformly spread over time because of the linear nature of the group delay. <coughs> okay, so now let's proceed to ask the question, uh, if we had a channel with this kind of characteristic in the frequency domain or this characteristic in the time domain, um, how, you know, how would we detect the pulse H of T? <coughs> okay, so I said I was going to choose the Fourier series analysis. So uh, this is the Fourier series analysis of the pulse H of T. Uh, it consists of a set of harmonics, which are harmonics of 1 over t, the time duration of the signal. There's a normalizing factor 1 over k, which simply forces the energy to be unity. Um, there's an energy term, square root of energy. So this is, e, you know, e sub s is the total energy in the pulse h of t. Uh, there's a set of coefficients c, the m, c sub m. We call this the spreading sequence. But what it is is the coordinate, you know, the coordinates of the signal with respect to this basis, which we want to be completely random, but we're actually going to choose to be pseudo-random. So these C sub m are pseudo-random values, uh, which at the transmitter might be generated using pi, a uh, binary expansion of pi, and at the receiver, we can generate the signal, the same coefficients by using the same uh, algorithm. So the assumption is the transmitter and the receiver have chosen the same pseudo-random algorithm. Pi would not be the only possibility, so we would presumably have to search over some other, other possibilities. Uh, you know, have sort of a uh, you know, contest, like the dancing with the stars or something, to decide what are the best pseudo-random algorithms to, to look for. Um, the, the other thing we have here is a window function which time limits. You know, the Fourier series goes on forever, and so this window function time limits the signal to zero to capital T. Uh, 
Um, now, the question is, what is the effect of this ISM on a signal like that? Well, we can uh, look at one of these harmonics and say, what is the response of the ISM to one of these harmonics? And it's simply uh, WT, the window function, times the complex exponential in through this uh, frequency response. And at the output, we get uh, the same frequency. Um, and that's because it's linear and time invariant. Uh, we get a phase shift, which is the phase of the ISM at the, at the frequency, f, f naught, whatever f naught is. And the window function is delayed by the uh, group delay at that frequency. Uh, this is making a linear approximation for the phase in the vicinity of the frequency f naught, so we're assuming narrow bandwidth. So the effect is pretty simple. It delays the window function by the group delay and it multiplies by the carrier, the harmonic, by this phase. Okay, so the window function is quite long, relatively speaking. It's capital T seconds long. And so as long as capital T is larger than the maximum group delay, then the effect of this group delay can be ignored on the window. Remember, we're getting different group delays at different harmonics, but the effect can be pretty much ignored if capital T is on the order of, say, twice uh, the maximum group delay. So immediately we get a constraint that life is much simpler for the receiver if T is chosen to be on the order of but larger than the maximum group delay. And the maximum group delay depends on several factors. Um, so we've narrowed down the search. You know, we're going to have to search over different T's. We've narrowed down that search considerably. And these kind of propagation impairments, all of them are helpful in that respect. Um, so in the receiver, we go through a filter bank. This is sort of standard communications lore. Uh, demodulate that particular ch uh, harmonic, window, uh, apply a match filter to the window function and sample, and we get a, a vector of samples. Um, it, present in this vector of samples is not only the signal, which depends, has a phase term from the ISM, but also a noise term, which is due to the thermal noise on the channel and also will have interference, but right now we're, we're concentrating on noise. Then the th next thing we do is something called despreading, which means that we get rid of the uh, random sequence, the spreading sequence, by multiplying by its co complex conjugate in the receiver. What that does is its, its function intuitively is to spread the interference. Whatever the interference looked like before we did this at the input to the receiver, after we do this, the interference looks like white noise. And that's why the performance of the receiver is independent of what the interference is, because whatever the interference is, after this despreading operation, it looks like white noise. At the same time, it doesn't affect uh, the noise statistics in any way. <coughs> and now we ask, uh, how do we measure the performance the question we're interested in is what is the effect of the ISM on our ability to detect the signal? Okay, and, the, and, and that's one question. The other question is what algorithm do we use in the receiver for detecting the signal in the presence of this severe phase distortion caused by the ISM? And of course the reduction in sensitivity depends on what algorithm we use. So how do we measure that? Well, we're not interested in giving up anything in terms of the false alarm probability and the detection probability. False alarm probability is the probability that we signal, oh, the ET's out there when in fact it was just noise that was you know, exceeding our threshold in our receiver. Uh, detection probability is the problem, the probability that we detect a signal if there is a signal, okay? What we'd like to do is to maintain fixed false alarm probability and detection probability, and not allow those to change. Well, then that means as a result of this ISM uh, dispersion, we have to increase the received signal energy, ES. So we're measuring the penalty 
caused by the ISM and this ISM stress test, we're measuring that penalty by the increase in energy required, received energy required to maintain the same detection and false alarm probabilities. Uh, if we use this notation that the energy is similar to F of K, uh, if the, for large K, the received energy required to maintain constant sensitivity is proportional to F of K for K large. And we are interested in large K because that's the regime where we get good uh, interference rejection. <coughs> um, now these are the actual uh, functions that, that pop out using different received algorithms. Uh, one, this one is a little unfair because it's kind of a lower bound assuming that the receiver knows exactly the group delay, the, knows exactly the dispersion measure. That's, of course, impractical, but it gives us a lower bound. In that case, the energy is similar to one. That is, there is no energy penalty in that case because we use a match filter. Um, as we said earlier, the performance of the match filter is independent of K, independent of the uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. Another very good algorithm is uh, maximum likelihood, and I'll say what that is in a m little bit gives me the square root of log k dependence, energy estimation, square root of k, and estima direct dis uh, estimation of dispersion is k. Practically speaking, what do these numbers mean? Well, here's a plot of the, on a log-log plot of the increase in energy required to maintain constant false alarm and detection probabilities uh, for these four functions. One, square root of log k, square root of k, and k. Uh, so we can see that one, there is no penalty. For log, square root of log k, there's a small penalty. And for square root of k, there's a larger penalty. And for k, there's a larger yet penalty. To get some perspective, uh, at k equal 10 to the sixth, that means that the degrees of freedom is a million, which would correspond, say, to one megahertz bandwidth and one second time duration. At that degrees of freedom, we would get 60 dB of suppression of any interference at the input to the receiver. So the good news is the interference is suppressed by 60 dB. The bad news is that the received energy has to be increased by a factor, depending on which of these algorithms we use, of 3.7, 1,000, or a million. So if ET was transmitting a megawatt, then uh, it would have to be increased to 3.7 megawatts or uh, a gigawatt or a terawatt. Okay. So, uh, so the, the uh, match filter is simple. It's simply a match filter, but there's one additional um, wrinkle in there that we have to worry about incoherent carrier. We don't have a carrier phase reference. So compared to the conventional match filter, if you're familiar with that, we have to add another uh, uh, taking a magnitude at the output, which gets rid of that carrier phase and also adds in basically twice as much noise. And that's just our isotropic noise performance. Energy estimation, we simply uh, t estimate the energy in the, in the output of this bank of fil this filter bank by taking the magnitude squared and summing it over all channels. And then we take the square root and we apply that result to the threshold you know, for detection. It turns out that in that case, the energy has to increase as the square root of k, which we saw in the example of k to the 10 to the 6 as a factor of 1,000 increase in energy. Or a megawatt transmit becomes a gigawatt transmit. Uh, and that's an increase in transmit power as a result of this plasma dispersion and trying to use a fairly large number of degrees of freedom. Okay, and the, the in intuition behind that is simply that the energy detector is adding up the energy of the total noise, not just the noise in the direction of the signal. Okay, so that's why we're getting this K dependence. Now let's get a little more sophisticated and let's say that we have a little bit more knowledge about what the uh, plasma dispersion is. In particular, based upon astronomical observations, we typically know the 
a range of, dis of, of uh, DMs, a range of, of dis dispersion measures uh, between a minimum and a maximum. So what we can do is equalize for the minimum. The result is a reduction in the total dis delay spread and it also means that the, de the de um, delay is between zero and the maximum rather than between some minimum and maximum. So let's assume we've done that. Then if we know that there's some maximum delay spread based on astronomical observations in the particular direction we've gone, then uh, we know that the impulse response is time limited. Okay? Um, and so for a specific uh, carrier frequency, bandwidth, and line of sight, we know that the delay spread is, is bounded, then we can, uh, we know therefore that the impulse response is bounded. So we can make use of that by first of all doing the minimum delay equalization as I mentioned, then doing the inverse DFT to calculate the impulse response and then summing the energy not over all coordinates, not over, not over all k coordinates, but only the first l coordinates where l is chosen according to our, knowledge, our prior knowledge of the maximum dispersion measure. When we do that, we get an energy that's proportional not to the square root of wt, but the square, square root of the delay spread times w. So the uh, energy penalty becomes independent of T and becomes dependent upon the delay spread. This shows concretely what I said at the beginning, which is the more you know about the signal, the more sensitive your detection can be. In this particular case, knowing more about the signal means knowing more about the delay spread, which then redux reduces the energy penalty required. Um, and this is still a computationally um, you know, low low complexity algorithm, relatively speaking. Um, next to last, <laughs> a maximum likelihood detection. Uh, simply, the basic idea is to repeat the match filter for different values of delay spread. We don't know the delay spread, so we simply build a bank of match filters for different values of delay spread. So it's essentially a searching strategy. And in that case, there's no noise penalty each of, for each one of those match filters. Um, however, there is a penalty in false alarm probability because we have a set of different match filters and each one of those might trigger a false alarm. So we have to up the signal energy a little bit in order to keep the false alarm probability constant. And that's why we get the square root of log L uh, characteristic. The final technique I'll talk about is estimating the phase directly. One of the things we notice is that the uh, delay spread, remember, was equal to the derivative of the phase. So if we calculate the first difference of the phase in our observation, that's an estimate of the delay spread. So in fact, if we take the example earlier and plot the first difference, we get a nice linear plot, even though the phase is this jumbled mess. If we plot the first difference, we get a nice linear curve. And if we take the exponential of i times the first difference, we get uh, real and imaginary parts of a complex sinusoid. So we can use those observations <coughs> um, to observe that in the case of the complex exponential, this is always going to be one, less than one full period of a sinusoid, so it's a very slowly varying function. So we would expect that it has relatively few degrees of freedom. Few degree of freedom means less noise. So in fact, uh, the degrees of freedom is five, that is five orthonormal vectors can represent that for any value of the dispersion measure. Two degrees of freedom of two suffices for most purposes. So all of that looks really encouraging. Unfortunately, the world is not as kind, nature is not as kind, because we can estimate this uh, complex exponential by taking the, the uh, first, the autocorrelation of the output of the filter bank with one, lag one. Uh, and so the signal component here is that sinusoid, we can apply uh, you know, relatively low degree of freedom uh, 
match filters to that. And the unfortunate fact is that the energy penalty is the square root of k, uh, the same as for the energy estimator. And the origin of the problem is noise on noise term here, that this noise on noise term in this autocorrelation uh, gives us a total noise in the, d in the receiver which is proportional uh, to k, the number, the degrees of freedom. And this is a characteristic that's shared by all autocorrelation algorithms. So autocorrelation algorithms have this basic flaw, you might say. Um, <coughs> the, finally, we can estimate the dispersion by taking the argument of this complex exponential. What we get is, this is a noisy version of a linear uh, first difference. And from that, we can estimate the slope by doing a, a, a linear regression and uh, we get a pretty good estimate. In fact, this is an estimate uh, for this relatively low signal to noise ratio case. Uh, and it, there's a bias. That's because we're at low signal to noise ratio. For the upper two cases, the bias goes away. Um, unfortunate thing here is that the energy in this case the energy penalty is proportional to K. It's even worse than the energy detector. And the reason for that is the per component nonlinearity of the modulo operation. So this is a case where a megawatt becomes a gigawatt at a uh, DOF of just degree of freedom of 10 to the sixth. Okay, so the conclusions flowing out of that regarding specifically dispersion we can make the following general statements. The direct estimate of the delay spread is too noisy. There's, there's no possibility of uh, estimating the delay spread directly. However, my, maximum likelihood detection uh, requires only a modest penalty in, in uh, received energy, but it is computationally expensive. And a good, uh, you know, one that that uh, is a good compromise, one would argue, is energy estimation taking in advantage of no prior knowledge of the range of delay spread. That's a low complexity algorithm, uh, requires a larger increase in received energy. However, that penalty goes away as we increase the carrier frequency because the delay spread goes down as the cube of the carrier frequency. So if we're willing to use a large carrier frequency, then most of these problems go away. Um, so the conclusion of that is use a large carrier frequency to reduce the uh, energy penalty and, comp and computational burden for the receiver. Uh, there's a constraint on the T. We have to search over T, the length of the signal, but that search is constrained by the um, by the delay spread, that help, that's helpful. And for reasons that I haven't stated, a search over bandwidth is not necessary. So let me summarize the whole talk for you, so hopefully you go away with a certain set of messages. In white Gaussian noise, detectors should use a match filter, and there is no penalty in terms of uh, received energy for using a match filter, no matter what the bandwidth or the time duration. For radio frequency interference, the signal uh, optimally appears to, to statistically resemble band-limited and time-limited white Gaussian noise, just like the noise. And we should use large uh, time bandwidth products, as large as practical. The ISM bandwidth stress uh, tells us that there is a trade-off between the computational burden that we suffer in the receiver and a set of factors. One is the carrier frequency. As the carrier frequency increases, that computational burden decreases dramatically. Uh, prior knowledge of the dispersion measure, um, the more we know about the dispersion measure, the better our weather forecasting for the ISM, the less computation is required in the receiver. The received energy penalty also depends upon the trade-off of computational burden. We can use an algorithm that is much more computationally intensive and reduce the energy penalty. 
And finally, interference rejection. If we're willing to increase the computational effort, we can reduce the effect of interference on the receiver on the detection. So just a few takeaways. Uh, if you go away from this talk having learned nothing more than these three things, I'll be happy. One is that optimization is a very useful tool for, for providing implicit design coordination between ourselves and uh, ET. Whether we're transmitting or receiving, it doesn't matter. Uh, propagation impairments constrain search parameters, so they're actually helpful. We should feel fortunate that the ISM is not a you know, perfect free space medium because it tells us a lot about what frequencies to look at, what uh, time duration of signals to look at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, the more a priori knowledge of the signal, the more sensitive the detection, basic fact of nature. And uh, that's why today the searches are looking for a very specific uh, narrowband signal. They're basically assuming a very specific signal, and that gives us greater sensitivity and detection. Um, the final thing I'd say is put in an advertisement for communication engineering as a field which is immediately relevant to SETI. And in my opinion, there should be an ongoing communication uh, research effort within the SETI uh, community and project. Okay, that's it. And I guess we have... If you're willing, as to the extent you're willing to, <laughs> thank you. I, I can stay as long as you're willing to stay around and answer questions. Okay, well, we ran over a bit because we got Dave started late with our <laughs> klutzing around. And I also ran, ran a little long. <laughs> so any of you that have to leave to make other appointments, feel free to do so. The rest of you, um, we can stay around for another 15 minutes or so for questions. So, who has the first question? And now do you understand why it's, how it's <laughs> even a miracle why your cell phone works? Because it <laughs> does this sort of thing. Like Actually, this is all extremely simple compared to what goes on in the cell phone. I think I'm back on some of the early slides, but you talked about the sources of noise sending their signals out isotropically. Is there any influence on the anisotropy of the number of sources with distance, for, for example, in our galaxy? Well, we don't know. You mean sources of noise or sources of signal? Sources of noise. Sources of noise. No, uh, the you know the nature of Gaussian noise is when you add different Gaussian noise sources, you still get Gaussian noise. So it simply affects the power or the energy of the noise. It doesn't affect its statistics otherwise. Uh, you've um, you pointed out that the dispersion problem goes away rapidly with frequency at high free, toward the high end of the microwave. And also, scattering goes away with frequency, too. Yeah. And I didn't say that, but that's true. <laughs> when I gave a talk here a year ago, I pointed out that cost drops with frequency as well because of antennas. And therefore, uh, it's w w these arguments coupled together should say we should be looking in the upper end of the microwave. We'd be a lot more likely to find something. If we're looking for broadband signals. We one, for mm -hmm. example, gigahertz. Right. And yet all the, um, all, not all, but most of the searches are down where the interference is optimized, <laughs> not the reception. You, is that the way you see it? Uh, yeah, I'm sure there are other factors that I'm not taking into account here. I've simply looked at, uh, uh, you know, particular ISM impairments. I've looked at, uh, you know, particular modulation schemes, broadband signals, and so forth. But within the realm of what we, where we've looked here, and I would add antenna gain increases for a given size of antenna, although the tolerances on the antenna uh, are, are a factor. Mm. <coughs> right. So for a given collection area, you get a higher antenna gain and a higher equivalent radiated power, and therefore uh, can transmit less. Your know, utility bill should be lower. Uh, there would be an increase in cost of the electronics, uh, you know, the RF electronics, I would assume, going to higher uh, carrier frequencies. Uh, so there's a number of factors, but I'd say overall it seems that way that we should be searching the highest frequencies we can. Mm -hmm. other, other questions for Dave? So did I misunderstand or or did you say that 
all of this pretty much leads to the conclusion that virtually all the searching we've done up till now in narrow band uh, was doomed. To no, I didn't say that. Signal. I said it would not detect the kinds of signals that I'm proposing or advocating here. But of course, the current searches would be effective at detecting signals which were themselves narrow band. The argument uh, and the argument against narrow band signals is they can't be information bearing. So, you know, would ET transmit a signal which was go to all the trouble of transmitting a signal just to attract our attention without also embedding information in it? That's a judgment factor. Uh, and the other argument against the narrow band is it's much more susceptible to interference than a broadband signal. So, you know, there are other ways of dealing with interference uh, than techniques I've talked about. Uh, you know, if you detect a narrow band signal coming from a certain place in the galaxy, the, obviously the first thing you do is look at it from another telescope, the same, the same point, the same point. And if you don't see the signal in that other telescope, then you know that it was terrestrial-based interference. So. There are other techniques for uh, you know, rejecting interference. Now, I would say, however, that those techniques have operational difficulties. You know, they increase the operational costs because there's typically a fair amount of manual effort involved in ruling out uh, you know, sources of interference. So um, you know, if, if, if ET is sympathetic, my argument, if ET is sympathetic to our interference scenario and probably thinks our interference is much worse than it really is, because ET is probably more advanced and has gone further down that path than we have, uh, then ET, a sympathetic ET, would transmit a broadband signal in our direction, all other things being equal. Um, but even more interesting to me than that argument is that interference is a foundation principle upon that tells us a whole lot about the nature of the signals we should be looking for, uh, whereas noise tells us nothing. <laughs> Uh, so interference is very interesting as sort of a credible environmental factor which highly constrains the kind of signals that you would transmit and receive based on optimization criteria. So that, that to me is the kind of thing we should be looking for in terms of this implicit coordination between transmitter and receiver. Hi, thank you. Uh, interesting talk. Uh, uh, curious. We know what a narrowband signal looks like, a delta function frequency space. And I think the waveforms that you showed us were essentially statistically indistinguishable from noise as a mo modality of communication. Right. Mm -hmm. Have you investigated using a wavelet representation so you're, you're kind of trading off both frequency and time? You're not narrowband, but you're conveying a lot of information in a symbol-by-symbol symbol rate. And I uh, wonder if you'd mm -hmm. speak to that. Uh, no, the answer is no, I have not considered wavelets, but I think that would be a very interesting line of investigation. Uh, that gets to this question of what set of basis functions do you use? And I argued, uh, well, it's either uh, you know, Fourier series or sampling theorem. You've now uh, pointed out another basis that would be very interesting to investigate. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, so that's the kind of thinking we should have because you know we do have to get to get anywhere. We do have to use the same basis as a ET, and so we should be thinking about uh, well, you know, what possible bases might ET use? Now, you know, sampling theorem and Fourier series, I would argue, are very fundamental because they arise in lots of physical processes, uh, but certainly those are not the only possibilities, and and uh, then. Then the next question to ask, well, why would they choose something different than those obvious choices? And you would have to come up with some credible argument, I think, that, you know, that there's some big advantage to using this different basis. And in fact, for something like wavelets, you might be able to come up with such an argument. Can we thank Dave one more time? Okay, thank you.